Wow. Wow, I cannot believe I'm finally talking about The Irishman. Don't worry, in this review, I will not subject you guys to my horrible De Niro and Pacino impressions that I feel I do an excellent job at when I am by myself in the car. I've been craving this movie since I was a little kid. I love mob movies in general. As a matter of fact, the only portrait painting I've ever bought is right over there. If you'll allow me to indulge, just wanna give a little bit of backstory on my anticipation that I've had for this movie since I was a little kid. The first time I saw Goodfellas, I believe I was in the seventh grade. It led me on a path of binging Scorsese films. Experiencing the glory of De Niro and Pesci sharing the screen in films like Raging Bull, Goodfellas, and Casino, you guys know. And then of course there was the Al Pacino films. And this was after he had already come out. And in that movie they only shared like 10 minutes of screen time together. But this was before Righteous Kill came out, which is the one we don't talk about. I hate that movie. You know the way we acknowledge Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone in Crazy Stupid Love and La La Land, but we don't really talk about their sophomore movie, Gangster Squad? Whatever that is for them, that's what Righteous Kill is for De Niro and Pacino. Growing up as a cinephile, does it sound pretentious to call myself a cinephile? Yes, yes it does. Anyway, when I was young, I'll speed this up. <laughs> I remember when I watched Godfather 2 with Al Pacino as Michael Corleone, De Niro as young Vito Corleone. That just started wanting us to see a movie with De Niro and Pacino sharing the screen the whole time in a good movie, not that righteous kill crap. It's like whenever they would do those fades from one storyline to the next, you're like, ah, oh, but they're never gonna cross paths in this movie. So in junior high, I created my own little binge fest. First I'd watch the Godfather movies, then I'd watch a solo De Niro movie, then a Pacino movie, then a De Niro movie, then a Pacino movie, so on and so forth, all to culminate to watching the movie Heat. My own little cinematic universe of sorts. But let's face it, as great as Heat was, like a lot of people, we all knew that we'd want to see them on screen together under the direction of Martin Scorsese, specifically a Scorsese gangster film. And now here we are with The Irishman. Wow, uh, does it deliver? To hell with those theme park movies. <laughs> no, 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 they're great too. So the plot description on Wikipedia describes the synopsis the best, and frankly, eh, his name's Frank De Niro's character's name. Frankly, I would just spend way too much time trying to figure out the most concise way to tell you the plot, so I'm just gonna say it right here. In the 1950s, truck driver Frank Sheeran gets involved with Russell Buffalino and his Pennsylvania crime family. As Sheeran climbs the ranks to become a top hitman, he also goes to work for Jimmy Hoffa, a powerful teamster tied to organized crime. The best way I can describe my experience with this film is that it gave me everything I wanted, but executed in such a different way than I anticipated it would. I actually saw this movie a little over a week ago. Shouts out to the Egyptian theater because they did an amazing screening. I love the introduction. Over the past week, there's still scenes that I'll just randomly think about or flash to in my own mind. And they're not even like a loud bombastic scene or something like that, or a cool scene. A lot of times they're just scenes where characters are just contemplative or thinking or affected by something and you're just watching their expression. Those are the scenes that I find to be like the most effective actually in this film. I think it's important to note that if you are like a big Scorsese fan or if you like the older gangster films he's done, it's not that. It's not Goodfellas, it's not Casino. Sure, they're gonna draw comparisons, focuses on mafia characters. It has a narration from the main character that occasionally docks directly to the audience. There's violence, it spans a lot of time. So yeah, like there's some similarities on paper but it's really very different than those movies. If you look at specifically Goodfellas and Casino, I'd even throw Wolf of Wall Street in there. Those are really, really fast paced movies where a lot of the movie, specifically its first half, is dedicated to immersing you into the glossy, cool, excess lifestyle of being a criminal, where you can actually see the temptations of the criminal lifestyle to the point as a viewer, you're like, oh man, that looks awesome. A lot of great soundtracks to all these awesome scenes and montages, and the narration is so constant in those films to the point where it's kind of a soundtrack of its own. And in those movies, the main characters have a love story, which creates a lot of problems for them. This movie is not that. There's nothing in here that makes the criminal lifestyle seem appealing. There's no gloss to it. Its pace is more meditative. It's a much more patient film. There's a lot of moments, especially with De Niro, and a good amount with Joe Pesci and a good amount with De Niro and Pesci sharing the screen, where you just watch them think and it's consistently compelling. The way I describe the pacing and overall style of this film is somewhere in between the Scorsese that made Silence and the Scorsese who directed Goodfellas. I mean, the narration isn't as heavy. There's actually a lot, a lot of amazing original music by Robbie Robertson, as opposed to a, like a, a whole crazy playlist. There's no, it's just a shot away from Rolling Stones in here that wouldn't fit in this movie. In fact, there's about a 20 to 30 minute sequence in the, in the last like third of this movie that has no music 
music, no narration. This is really tense buildup and probably the most tense experience I've had at the theaters all year. I'd say that maybe in like the first 45 minutes of this film before Jimmy Hoffa comes into the picture, there were maybe a couple of things that slightly dragged, but really underlined that word slight. Cause it is a while before Hoffa shows up. The first third of this movie is heavily focused on really fleshing out the early years of Frank Sheeran and then his relationship with uh, Joe Pesci's Russell Buffalino and then how their connection eventually led into Jimmy Hoffa. And I'm not super familiar with the real life story of Jimmy Hoffa. But I do know that a big part of the mystique, at one point in time, he just vanished. Presumably murdered. A lot of theories about who killed him or what happened to him. You know, I've been going around for years and it is just added to his legacy. But at the end of the day, no one really knows what happened to him. So factoring that into this movie, because the movie is, explores that. So I don't know how much of it is actually true or not, but in terms of storytelling, it is an excellent work of art. This movie's about like three and a half hours, but it really earns that runtime. It's all through the perspective of our Irishman, Frank Sheeran. You really get to explore his life before getting involved with the Mafia, how he got involved with the Mafia, the most major events of that time, the relationships he formed, and then you even focus a lot post-major events into his elderly years. It's weirdly like a slice of life film with a Scorsese gangster backdrop. So with the pace and runtime, it turns into a movie that I can only describe as reflective. Through its characters, it explores themes of being a father, brotherhood, legacy, regret, loss, betrayal, the consequences of the choices that we make, the impact and lingering gravity of choices that we may not at the time have realized would be so utterly life-changing. What I've also found very fascinating with this movie is it really explores the question of how much of what we did or do will really be remembered? Will it really matter in our later years? How will it affect us as human beings? Most of us don't live the lifestyle of these kinds of criminals, but yet it still points is the question to us, and but especially to them. I mean, Scorsese is my favorite director. He's been incredibly consistent over the decades. It seems like every era he makes some defining film of that decade. And he always matures as a director and especially shows on screen with this movie. I don't think this should be his last movie, but I could definitely see it being his last gangster film and I would be A-OK -okay with that. It's like a great culmination of, of all his work. I mean, that being said, I don't think you need to see other Scorsese films in order to appreciate and perhaps even love this movie. However, I think the idea of feeling Scorsese reflecting on his own past work can only be felt if you've seen his past work, you know the end of that sentence. A little tease I can give you into what I mean by that. And whether it's intentional or not, this is kind of how I connected with certain moments that felt re-examined by the filmmaker. There's a scene in Goodfellas when Ray Liotta finds out his girlfriend was hit by her neighbor. And it's also like one of the most badass scenes of all time. Not not like her getting hit, you don't, you don't even say, I would never say her getting, you know what I'm trying to say. It's when Ray Liotta drops his girlfriend off, grabs a gun and one long shot, crosses the street, beats the neighbor, threatens him, and asks his girlfriend to hide the weapon. Now from our perspective and even his girlfriend's perspective, she's drawn to him. Yeah, it's illegal, dangerous, scary, but it's also alluring because hey, look at him protecting her. And I'll tell you, being a young lad in seventh grade, I was like, I want to grow up and be that kind of man to a woman. And uh, I, I am not. She'll vouch. But very early on in this movie, this is not really a spoiler, but I, I, won't, I won't go into detail about it. There's a moment that kind of reflects something similar in terms of like a scene and plot point that I thought would evoke a, the same kind of response. But this time it's involving Frank and his daughter witnessing an act of protection through violence. By the end of what is kind of a similar scene, it doesn't feel cool or badass. It actually feels like this is traumatizing and scary for a loved one to witness. If you've seen the movie, you know what I mean. If you haven't, you will know what I'm talking about. Because I think with Scorsese films like, you know, Goodfellas, Casino, Wolf of Wall Street, there's so much of that luxurious, greedy, excess lifestyle explored. That even though those films have endings in a way that are telling you what they did wasn't cool, it's still easy to walk away thinking it's pretty freaking cool. I mean, most of us think of like the cool stuff that they did in those movies. There's still memes of DiCaprio and Wolf of Wall Street I see all the time on social media from like influencer entrepreneurs. I'm like, he, he was bad though. But the Irishman is not that. You will not walk away with that effect. It shows you early on and throughout how much of an emotional toll this can be on the individuals involved and the people in these individuals' lives. That by the end of this movie, which has this beautiful haunting line, like, like wow, what a, 
What a great last shot. I'd hearken it to like the great last shot of The Godfather. It's not the same thing, but you know, it's like, that's the best comparison I can make. I felt sorry for these characters. Not one part of me wishes I could have had any participation in the journey here. So all in all, from the direction of Scorsese, the writing by Steve Zalian, which is based on a book by Charles Brand, and the editing by longtime collaborator, Thelma Schoonmaker. The filmmaking is a 10 out of 10. Do you feel the runtime? Sure, you're sitting for three and a half hours. You're you're bound to feel the runtime. Did it feel that long? Definitely not. Really, I'm asking you that when I know most people are gonna watch this at home on Netflix, which is okay, which is totally fine. I'll be rewatching it on Netflix. Please don't be on your phones. Even though it doesn't feel like three and a half hours, it still requires a patient viewer. They let scenes ruminate. You explore these friendships, these lifestyles. They let the plot slowly envelop. And it also has a surprising amount of heart. Like these are tough, intimidating characters played by some of the toughest tough guys in Hollywood. But each performer has such sincerity and care to their portrayal. Joe Pesci surprised the hell out of me. The guy was retired, he came out of retirement for this movie, and of course he's an amazing actor, we all know that. But his portrayal of Russell Buffalino is not what we've seen in Goodfellas and Casino. It's more reserved, it's patient, it's sincere, it's sympathetic, yet very cold. You could feel this man cares, but is definitely haunted by his own demons. It was so layered in every moment, and man, his scenes with De Niro, mwah, I don't even think that's a real word. I mean, De Niro is exceptional in this film. This is back to a more quiet version of De Niro, like, yeah, He's a hitman. He paints houses, as they call it. He's a tough guy in this movie, but there's some type of strange innocence he brings to the character's eyes in this movie. A strange mix of detached yet compassion and sensitive. Soft yet can be a bulldozer. Do I sound more pretentious than I did earlier? That's okay. And this is easily the best performance I've seen of Al Pacino in a motion picture in a very long time. I haven't seen the HBO movies he's done as of late, but in terms of like going to the theaters, this is the best I've seen him in a long time. And he's doing more of what we'd expect from Pacino. He's very expressive, he's a loud character, but he's not always that way in this movie. There are some moments that are very somber, quiet, a lot of great tension-filled moments with him. Both him and Pacino bring a, a, a sort of boyish quality to their roles in certain scenes. And watching this man's powerful descent and fear of losing his legacy made for another surprising portrayal where I, I felt pity for him in a weird way. I was sympathetic to all these, you know, Characters who are technically not good people. So the three main players we came here to see all give 10 out of 10 performances easily. I didn't know what I'd want out of seeing De Niro and Pacino share the screen together in a gangster film. But what we got was the formation of two men slowly becoming best friends. And it's awesome. It's unexpected. I loved it. I kid you not, there are moments I felt hurt and heartbreak. I certainly expected to feel tension. I expected to be enamored by everything on a filmmaking scale. I certainly walked in expecting to admire some intense dramatic performances. But I felt a lot more emotions than I anticipated. There's this wonderful relationship with De Niro and his daughter where there's really not a lot of dialogue between them. Anna Paquin plays the older version of uh, his daughter. Visually, we just watch this relationship become more and more distant. She obviously knew knows or has a pretty good idea of what he probably does for a living. He's doing it for his family, yet it's pushing his family away. It's it's wonderfully uh, complex. That whole relationship is done in such a quiet way. It's really like the tone poem moments of this film. The supporting cast is wonderful too. Ray Romano is hilarious, but blends right in. It doesn't feel like he's in a comedy. Jesse Plemons has a few great moments where he gets to really shine. Great scene, Harvey Keitel, back in a Scorsese film. Awesome scene to have a scene with uh, Nero and Pesci. This guy really should be talked about. Steven Graham, who I first saw in the movie Snatch. He plays uh, Tony Provenzano, who's one of the most focused on supporting characters. He deserves a heap ton of praise too. My one and only real criticism with this film, this is gonna be very subjective in a different way because it's really about how much you can adjust or look past this. For me, it kept pulling me in and out of the movie at the beginning of a lot of scenes. There's like a lot, a lot of scenes in this movie, but at the beginning of a lot of scenes, primarily in the first third of this film, which was the de-aging. Now, the de-aging is actually quite incredible here, especially with Joe Pesci and Al Pacino. I honestly could never tell with those two. De Niro, though, <laughs> which is kind of sad because he's the main character. There are times where definitely did not look very good. I mean, it was clearly the best it could be. I don't think I did myself any favors re-watching Godfather 2 and Casino a few days before watching this because I was very much well aware of what younger versions of De Niro actually look like. Pesci and Pacino lined up with that. 
he did not. Now, that being said, I feel like for a lot of people, even though it doesn't look authentically like the younger versions of De Niro we've seen before, it's a such a constant look and the movie's just so damn good that I feel like you could just adjust and accept that's just how he looks. But honestly, it's really just a small thing compared to this grand film. Because as much as for my personal view of the experience that at times it was a hurdle to get past, it ultimately didn't affect how much I love this movie. And I still think De Niro is absolutely incredible. I give it a 10 out of 10, easily one of the best movies of the year. Please go watch it. All right guys, well, thanks for watching my review. I know I went pretty long on this one, but hey, you know, it's, um, I've been waiting for this movie since I was a kid. And a lot of people don't really watch our actual movie reviews. Tell me, what did you think of The Irishman? Would you want to see De Niro and Pacino do another film together? Do you want Scorsese to keep doing gangster picks? Just talk about anything you want in the comment boxes. Hit subscribe, hit the like button, hit, click the notification bell. Duh, the, the video's done.